Welcome to this session. Agriculture has links to climate change and biodiversity loss. Some farmers are taking the lead on regenerative agriculture. They have become the heroes of tackling climate change and loss of nature. Let's hear more. Welcome to this session. I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour of soil, food waste, biodiversity and agriculture and solutions. Essentially, we're going to link what's happening with agriculture to climate change and to loss of biodiversity. What I don't cover in this session is how agriculture affects our water systems and oceans. Maybe that's something you could research search later. So, around the world, farmers are walking away from lands they once cultivated and grazed because those lands have been farmed out. Essentially, the soil has been exhausted and it can't grow plants anymore. A Stanford University study estimates that there are between 950 million and 1.1 billion acres of deserted farmland. But what is soil? Well, it's rock that has been broken down and weathered when water flows over it. Rock supplies soil with minerals. It also is made up of organic matter, so like dead plants and animals that have been broken down. It has water and it has gases and it has lots of organisms. Now, why am I starting here with soil? Well, without soil, land plants as we know them could not grow. And without plants, no animals would survive. Now, a teaspoon of healthy soil contains more organisms than the entire human race. That's a lot. And we, if we just looked at the bacteria in the soil, we'd find that in a top foot of a single acre of fertile soil, the total weight of bacteria could be as much as a thousand pounds. That's like a thousand bags of sugar. There are many different types of organisms in the soil. Bacteria, fungi, springtails, mites, earthworms. But what do these organisms do? Well, they decompose dead plants and animals. They return the minerals in these back into the ground. They take nitrogen from the atmosphere and they put it into a form that plants can use. Essentially, these organisms, they actually make soil. Soil also stores carbon. And this is really important because this is where soil can be used to tackle climate change. The top couple of meters of soil contain about three times as much carbon as the entire atmosphere. But what's the problem? Well, adding chemical fertilizers, things like nitrates and phosphates and potassium and magnesium, upsets the balance in soil. And in the long term, we end up releasing carbon into the atmosphere because of this. We spray insecticides or pesticides on the land, and that can kill the good organisms in the soil, as well as the ones that we don't want. So we end up interfering with natural processes occurring in the soil, interfering with those microorganisms making soil. The world's farm soils have lost between 50 and 70% of their carbon. That's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere that's trapping heat. 90% of soils are thinning and degrading. Soils are being wasted, they're washed away, and this is all because of the way we actually farm. However, there is a solution. We can restore these degraded soils to their former health by planting trees, using regenerative farming methods. It's estimated that farmland soils could reabsorb 88 billion to 110 billion tonnes of carbon, while also enhancing soil fertility, biodiversity, and enhancing the water cycle. Farmers can easily be the hero of this story. Farmers like Yakubu Sawadogo, and you can look at this book if you want to know more about this man, experimented with tree planting, and it increased his crop yields. He practiced something called tree intercropping, where basically trees are grown beside the crops. And these trees buffer the wind, they anchor the soil, and they boost soil fertility. So there are farmers who are practicing these regenerative farming techniques. And if you want to know more about that, do some research. It's really fast. Okay, so let's see how much you've learned. Let's see if you can match all of these questions up to the correct answers on the right hand side. Now your teacher can pause the video now while you do that. It should only take you two minutes 
you don't have to take these down your copy. You can just have a conversation with the person beside you and I'll go through the answers with you when you've done that. Okay, so why are some far farmers walking away from their land? The soil has been exhausted and they can't grow anything anymore. Why are soil organisms so important? They make the soil healthy and fertile. Why is healthy soil needed in the fight against climate change? Fertile soil can store more carbon. Why are soils thinning and degrading? Because of farming practices like adding fertilizers, plowing, spraying insecticides and things like that. How can we improve our soils? By using regenerative farming practices. I wonder how many answers you got there right out of five. I hope you did well. Okay, let's on, get on to food waste. So we know that we have to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions to net zero. This means that we have to get to a point where there is a balance. The amount of carbon we emit into the atmosphere fear, must be the same as the amount of carbon that we take out. But we also need to remove a lot of the carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere as well. So there is a book that I recommend you read. It's called, well, it's, it's Project Drawdown. It's the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. And they also have a website and they have a YouTube presence. So I checked that out. In this project, hundreds of scientists have actually ranked the most effective ways that we can remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Interestingly, reducing our food waste comes in at number three on the list. So reducing our food waste is the third most effective way to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And I was really surprised by that. I didn't know that. So why is food waste such a big problem? Well, 30% of food that we grow or prepare does not make it from the farm or fo factory to our dinner plates. That's a big percentage, and it's really awful considering that nearly 800 million people in the world suffer from hunger. The food that is wasted contributes 4.4 gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year. Now, what does that mean? That's roughly 8% of human greenhouse gas emissions just from food waste. So if food waste was like a country, it would be the third largest emitter and of, of global greenhouse gases. That's coming just behind the US and China. So let's reduce our food waste. And how do we do that? Okay, so plan your meals for the week so that you don't end up buying too much food. That's a simple thing that you have to do. It's also about making sure that you finish your meal. And if you don't finish your meal and there's kind of, or you don't finish the amount of food that you've cooked and there are leftovers, try to eat them on another day. You'll end up actually, your family will end up buying less food, saving money and saving all that horrible plastic packaging. So if you do end up having food waste, make sure you have your own compost bin or wormery. If we all dealt with our own food waste, we'd have less trucks around and that means we'd use less energy, so less emissions. Right. Here's a little activity for you. So you're going to, this is coming from Project Drawdown. Remember that they rank the, the best solutions to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So you're gonna place these in order of how much carbon they can remove from the atmosphere, from the highest to the lowest. So you've got educating girls, wind turbines, replacing hydrofluorocarbons and refrigeration with natural refrigerants and reducing food waste. So which one of these do you think is the highest and which is the lowest? Can you order them? Now, the challenge here is, if you have time, explain why you've made those choices. So maybe spend about two to three minutes on that, and then I'll get back to you with the answers. Okay, so the first is actually to do with refrigeration. The second is to do with wind turbines. The third is to do with reducing food waste. And at number six on the list is actually educating girls. So it's in that order. And if you want to know more about that, have a look at Project Drawdown. Okay, on to biodiversity and agriculture. So what percentage of trees globally are cut down to make toilet paper? What do you think? 
Well, it's actually like less than, some of you might have known this, less than 1% of global trees are cut down to make toilet paper. Actually, 0.0003%. The main reason for deforestation is farming. Now, this is really interesting. So this is a graph looking at global land use for food production. So I'm going to talk you through this now, and I hope it makes sense. So really actively listen to this. So what we have here is the Earth's surface, and 29% of the Earth's surface is land, which is actually quite small. Now, if we look at all of this land, all of this land surface, only 71% of that land is actually habitable. So we can only live on 71%. So now let's just take the habitable land, the land that we can live on. What do we use it for? Well, actually, 50% of it, we use it for agriculture. Now let's focus on this agricultural land. And this is where it starts to get interesting. So if we look at the agricultural land, we use actually most of the agricultural land for farming meat and dairy. So most of the agricultural land, that 77% is used to farm meat and dairy. That means that we use the land for grazing. So cows will be grazing the grass, but we also need land to grow food for the cows. So for example, in the summer, you'll see lots of tractors with trailers of hay. Now, interestingly, even though we use all of that land to actually farm meat and dairy, that only contributes a very small amount to our global food supply. That's 18%, which is very small. So what does this actually mean? It means that it takes a lot of space to grow a small amount of animal product because we need to grow lots of plants to feed the animals, which they convert to meat, milk, etc. And they do it very inefficiently. There's actually the small bit of land that we use to grow crops for human consumption, that actually contributes most of the food to the global calorie supply, 83% in fact. And if we look at how much protein we get from animals in our global protein supply, actually all of this land actually only contributes 37% to our, the amount of protein that we intake. So plants are basically more efficient. Now, this is an example of a field that is used to grow food for animals. The grass um, would have been cut and will be harvested to feed basically animals. So what would happen if we ate less meat? There'd be less demand for meat, so farmers will be, farms will become smaller, and there'd be more land available for nature, which would mean that there'd be more land for trees and more land for habitat, and wildlife. More trees would mean that more carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere. So reducing our meat intake helps to fight climate change and it also helps biodiversity. Okay, so let's talk about the ecological crisis for a minute because we not only have a climate crisis but we have a, a nature crisis too. And I use this acronym here, HIPOC, to kind of help me understand what are the drivers for ecological, the ecological crisis? Well, the first one, I wonder if you can guess it here with this picture. Yeah, it's habitat loss. And there's a gray squirrel to give you a hint for the next one. It's invasive species. And if you look at the pictures, they might give you clues to the next one. The next one would be pollution. And the next one is overfishing. And the last one is climate change. So all of these things are driving a decline in biodiversity. And biodiversity is a variety of life on Earth. And why is that a problem? Well, you might not realize it, but we are actually a part of nature. And if nature goes, well, so do we. We depend on nature. Ecosystem services are very, very, very important to sustain the planet. Now, the World Wildlife Fund for Nature has said in the last five decades, our planet's wildlife populations have plummeted in size by a certain percentage. This is only in 50 years. What percentage do you think that is? It's actually 68%, it's quite big. Now that's just an average, 
And actually, it's hard to connect with that figure. But if you were to think about the human population, and if you were, if we wiped out 68% of humans, we're talking about over 5 billion people. That's a lot of wildlife. Now, the, as I said, that's an average. If you look at freshwater organisms, their population has declined by 84%. Now, if you have read A Life on Our Planet or looked at the series or the episode, the documentary on Netflix even, you'll see that um, in David Attenborough's lifetime, populations have increased dramatically. The carbon in our atmosphere has also rapidly increased. And biodiversity well, there's a problem with nature and it's in trouble because our wilderness has actually nearly halved from 66% in 1937 to 35% now. So how has that actually impacted on wildlife around the planet? Well, let's have a look. Let's just consider all of the mammals on the planet by their weight. So if you were to look at humans, we'd contribute to 36% of all the mammals on the planet. That's actually really quite high. Livestock contribute 60% by weight. And that only leaves 4% for wild mammals. So we've really, like humans have, through agriculture, has, have actually really pushed down wildlife populations. If we look at birds, chickens and po other poultry make up 70 percent of the birds on the planet and so only 30 percent of birds are wild now if we look at other things in ireland and across europe we can see that our insect numbers have dropped i've seen that in my lifetime your parents probably have too and the teachers looking at this probably have as well so when i was a kid driving around my parents in the countryside in waterford on a sunday we might go for a drive in the summer visiting the relatives and we might be in the car for 30 or 40 minutes. And at the end of that journey, there'd be lots of bug splat on the windscreen and the fender of the car. That just doesn't happen now. If you went out for a drive, you wouldn't get that um, because they just aren't there. The populations have really diminished. If we look at the curlew as one example, in the 1980s, there was about 3,300 to 5,500 breeding pairs in Ireland. That's a big range of an estimate, but the numbers were 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 large and now in like we a survey in 2015 to 2017 estimated that there's 150 breeding pairs so you know there are knock-on impacts for nature if we look at barn owls there's 450 to 500 breeding pairs in ireland the numbers have fallen by 50 percent since the 70s hen harriers are 108 to 157 in ireland these are really really small numbers and this is because of the way we use land. So we've seen that like we use an awful lot of agricultural land for farming meat and dairy. And if we were to use less land for farming meat and dairy, we'd have more room for nature, which would mean biodiversity would bounce back and we'd be, we could plant more trees or rewild that land and that would help us to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and tackle climate change. Okay, you and I have something in common. We both live with our parents. I recently moved back from the UK to Ireland and I've taken up residence at home again, temporarily, hopefully. Um, I'm now 40, so it's, it's not a good look. Anyhow, I love my steak, but I have reduced my meat intake. Now my parents, and these are my parents here, they eat a lot of meat. They probably eat meat every day. And sometimes they'll have meat for lunch and dinner. And maybe sometimes they'll have actually meat three times a day if they have a fry for breakfast. Now it's recommended that the average man who doesn't exercise that much has 56 grams of protein per day. And the average woman should eat 46 grams of protein per day. Now, I just, for the fun of it, I weighed a portion of meat that my mum gave to me on a plate uh, for my dinner. And they were looking at me, why is he weighing that meat? And I was just curious. And it weighed over 300 grams. That's a lot of meat. That's way, way, way above the amount of protein that I actually need. So we eat too much meat, essentially. And when my mum and dad were kids, they hardly ever ate meat at all. 
it was a, it was a, it was like a delicacy <laughs> because their parents didn't have that much money so they just couldn't afford it but now meat is a part of their everyday life and it's an ingrained normality just something that basically they've always done and parents can be busy with work and life and stressed trying to keep the house going and a family going and manage jobs and trying to change their behavior or our own behavior is some something that's ingrained for example like cooking different meals can be like a huge monumental step maybe a step too far from someone who doesn't have much headspace to think about this so here's what worked for me with my parents i got some recipe books i tried some things out i did the shopping i cooked the meals and some meals i cooked they absolutely hated others they loved so I just cook more of the meals that they love. And it's just about trying something out and having some fun. So it's not about getting rid of meat from your diet completely, but it's about just saying, okay, right, if I'm eating meat seven days a week, let's try and eat it for like six. Make a small start. Or if I meet, eat meat five days a week, let's try and eat it for four. So just just make a, make a small push and start to change your behavior slowly. Okay, so just to think about what we've learned i want you to think about how many of these words can you use to show what you've learned from this part of the session so can you link these words up so you can pause the video now and take maybe two to three minutes to do that okay so you might have kind of been able to link up the fact that farming uses a lot of land to farm meat and dairy and that takes up a lot of space. So there's less room for nature, and that means that biodiversity is decreasing. It also means that there are less trees to take in carbon dioxide, and that has contributed to climate change. We know that 68% of wildlife, popula well, wildlife populations sorry, have plummeted in size by 68%. So we need to reduce our meat and dairy to make more space for nature, to increase biodiversity, and to tackle climate change. Okay, so let's look at some of the solutions. Now, we need to kind of, we need to support farmers. Farmers can be the heroes of the story and some are the heroes of the story. If they're empowered to put soils first, focusing on producing plants more than animals, using regenerative farming practices, which can restore the health of our so soils and tackle the climate emergency and loss of nature. Donald Sheehan of the Bride Project is doing an excellent job of farming with nature. He is working with other farmers to conserve and enhance and restore habitats in lowland intensive farmland. And he's doing that in, in Southern Ireland. So a group of farmers are encouraged to implement a range of habitat improvement measures. So people are doing this already. Farmers, as we know, have to make a living too. And one of the problems is that we now spend a smaller amount of our income on food. Essentially, meat is cheap. So because we're not paying as much for our food, farmers actually need to farm more intensively to get the same amount of money. In 1980, we actually spent nearly 30% of our income on food. However, by 2016, this percentage has fallen to half, to 15%. So we're just not spending as much money on our food. And that's putting pressures on, on farmers. So buy local, know where your meat is coming from, and pay more for quality meat. We can significantly and easily contribute to protecting nature by shifting to a more plant-based diet. The more we shift, the more space there is on earth to feed everyone, and the more space there is on earth for nature. Now, as you know, there are lots of meat substitutes, and some of them actually taste very similar to the real thing. Analysts think that plant-based meat will jump from $4.6 billion in revenue today to $85 billion in revenue in te just 10 years. That's huge. $4.6 billion to $85 billion. Times are changing, and some people are ahead of the curve. It's changes that we're making in lots of different sectors and fields. And it's actually 
quite an exciting time to be an entrepreneur. So by the way, my parents have actually been fooled with plant-based meat. So maybe that could be a fun game you could try with your own family. Ethan Brown, this man here you see on the slide, the picture is of really poor quality, sorry, is the founder of Beyond Burger. He used to produce, uh, he used to be a very successful renewable energy leader, and then he became a meat producer, um, starting Beyond Burgers, which are basically plant-based protein. And he's actually owned family were farmers. He says that his plant-based burgers use 99% less water, 93% less land. I mean, that's amazing. So if you have 100 acres, if you're a farmer of 100 acres, you can now grow on seven acres what you used to use the entire 100 acres for to produce the same amount of burger. Beyond Burgers also emit 90% fewer emissions and use half the amount of energy. So now we're going to go to a farmer, Noel Clancy in Tipperary, to find out what he thinks about all of this. Hello, my name is Noel Clancy. You join me on our family farm here in South Tipperary. I'm 37 and we uh, rear suckler cows and their beef calves. We bring them to beef and we also rear pedigree sheep and we also have commercial half-bred sheep which would be generally um, slaughtered for the supermarket trade and we sell some meat direct here from our farm as well in Tipperary. So it's a quite small mixed farm and we are in some environmental schemes. We've been in them for the last number of years. We try and keep a good mixture of trees etc on our farm as you can see and we try to manage the hedgerows in a, a, as nice way as possible. We, we rotate cutting them, we, we trim behind the electric fence every year in order to keep a current in our fence to keep a stock, our stock in. But we also practice traditional laying and stuff like that and we try and leave a story or uh, kind of a story of trees so that uh, there's a good selection of berries and stuff for the birds in the winter and so that everything is not cut at the same level every year as you see in some places. We eat most of our own beef and lamb as well. We'd always kill a heifer every year. Uh, we kill some lambs for our own freezer every year and we so nearly 95% of the beef and lamb we eat here is all our own. We're not organic. Um, there, there isn't a great market at the moment for organics in this country. It's growing slowly. It's more expensive to produce and I suppose it's more expensive to buy at the moment. So uh, our children are educated in the sense that they, they bring the lambs or the cattle into the local butcher when we're getting them killed for our own meat and they understand the process and they help us weigh them and everything else. Uh, I suppose I would say to people, if if you want us to change our system of farming, we're more than happy to do that. Definitely more than happy to change our system. Very open to change. But the, the biggest and best way you can do that is when you go into your local shop, go for the more expensive chicken or whatever, more expensive piece of beef. If you want to, that product, you want people to produce that organic product, uh, you, people need to put their money where their mouth is. If people in the shops, the consumers, look for the, that product, uh, or that more expensive product or that more of a niche product or niche as it is at the moment maybe it won't be in the future if you want that product or you want organic meat uh, by all means go ahead but you must be prepared to pay for it and we will produce whatever the consumer wants uh, the other thing I suppose is to say that uh, I would say be not maybe people maybe needn't to go for the really cheap quality meat cuts I would say maybe buy a little less meat but buy better quality I would say support your local butcher they'll hang their meat properly rather than the supermarket meat so maybe buy a little less rubbish in your supermarket trolley and buy a bit more quality um, and the same goes for the meat buy maybe a little less quantity and a bit better quality that's what I would say from our farm in Tipperary from myself and Ned the Sheepdog bye bye this is another activity that you could do right now if you've got time Design a family campaign. So you're going to convince your family to reduce their meat intake. So how are you going to get your family on board? How are you going to find a recipe they will like? And are there ways you can make this easier for them? So maybe if you map your um, campaign with a partner out in your copy, or you do it on the board, you could take a picture of it and tweet it and share it on Instagram and use the hashtag Climate Nature Summit or hashtag COP26, and that will allow you to have a conversation with other students and teachers in other schools who are basically doing the same thing during this week. 
I hope you found that session informative. So the action for this session is to reduce our meat intake. Have some fun, make some tasty meals. Why not make a sustainable dinner? Take a photo of your dinner and post it. Let us know your thoughts on this session or put out a call for action on social media and use the hashtags Climate Nature Summit and COP26.